her political persuasion. I understand. Let's see if Dr. Gardner and Dr. Paredes want to join us here. Okay, no problem. Morning, David. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Okay, you know, I have a phone call, but that's okay. We'll we'll get it to it later. I couldn't get you back. I understand. Morning. Good morning again, sir. Good morning. Good morning, buddy. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call the uh, this December 6th uh, meeting of the Strategic Planning Committee to order. Uh, we have a quorum that's unique this year for this committee, and I appreciate each of you being here. Uh, we don't have any snow or ice or hurricanes uh, impeding our, our path, so that's good. Um, uh, a couple of things I want to report uh, next Monday here in this room, uh, I believe at 10 again, 10 o'clock, uh, the capital funding uh, uh, work group or task force that Bob Shepard and I are working with uh, to see if we can come up with an alternative to capital funding for capital projects in this state other than the TRB process will be meeting. Uh, staff has been working. Uh, since our last meeting, uh, based on some various recommendations that we'll be looking at and discussing at that meeting, and hopefully we can come out of that meeting with uh, uh, some proposals to uh, to the leadership that will hopefully take some of the uh, feeding frenzy away from how we deal with uh, capital funding in this state and, and provide some reasonable planning opportunities for institutions that would be short-term and long-term in nature. Uh, I'd also like to remind the committee and those present that the, we have scheduled the uh, board meetings for uh, this next year in 07 for this committee. You might want to make a note of these dates, uh, March the 14th, 07. Welcome, Mr. Hellenfeld. Uh, March 14th, 07, June 13, 07, and September 12, 07. You might want to make a note of those dates. I believe those are on the website as well. Um, we also had planned this morning, um, uh, Bob Shepard, Nancy Neal, and several of us, I think Paul was there. Uh, we had a, uh, our annual uh, governing board conference in November uh, here in Austin for uh, new board of regents and chancellors and presidents. Uh, and a gentleman by the name of Ronnie Steck, who's with the firm of GSD&M, uh, has made that was the second time I'd seen his presentation, but that firm had been uh, retained by the National, Edu National Education Group. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what group that is, but um, basically to develop a nationwide marketing plan for higher ed, and uh, we were going to have him demonstrate some of the uh, uh, things that they're doing uh, that ties in, I think, very nicely with what we're doing in Texas in terms of our marketing campaign and closing the gaps. Uh, he's unfortunately had a family emergency and will not be with us this morning, but that may be a, a good, and that's not for him, but for in our sense, uh, but uh, we're going to try to get him at the board meeting in January, and I think um, uh, would have a broader uh, array of people to see what exactly is going on there, because I think it's, it's important that uh, everyone understand what's happening in that national marketing campaign. Um, we have seven projects. Uh, our meeting is posted from 10 to 2 today, but I can assure you the chair doesn't intend to be here at 2 o'clock. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we will move along. There are seven projects for consideration of recommending to the board for approval. Uh, the first project is a request to reapprove uh, construction of the uh, Mitchell Physics Building for Texas A&M University. Uh, when the Magenta materials were printed, the Board of Regents certification had not been received. I believe that has now been received. They met last week. Uh, uh, the uh, Dan Kennedy, uh, Dan, come forward if you'd like. Uh, Dan is here from Texas A&M to uh, provide an overview of this request for reapproval. Commissioner, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Adams and, and committee. Um, the Mitchell Physics Building Project was originally approved by the Coordinating Board uh, back in April of 2006 uh, at a total budget level of $57 million. 
in a building area of approximately 152,000 gross square feet. The project will consist of two components. One of them is the George P. Mitchell and Cynthia W. Mitchell Institute for Fundamental Physics and Astronomy building, which we'll be referring to as the Institute building. If you look at the slide over there, that's this tall building right here. That's what we'll call the Institute building. And the other component is the George P. Mitchell Physics building, which is the rest of the structure there. They will be arranged as shown in that particular slide there. The planning and design for this project is being developed by Michael Graves and Associates out of Princeton, New Jersey, under direct contract with the George Mitchell Interest. And the construction manager at risk for the project is Vaughn Construction Company of Houston, Texas. During the design development process, additional facility users' needs were identified. During the process, one is additional lab space, the need of additional lab space in the basement of the physics building, additional space for graduate student offices on the fourth floor of the physics building, and the addition of a basement level beneath the Institute building to create the Hawking Auditorium, allowing additional first floor space for lobby and reception and exhibit usage. The additional needs have increased the building size desired by approximately 24,000 gross square feet. In the design of this, as the staff has pointed out in their evaluation, the efficiency of this structure as currently being carried forward in the design right now is lower than the coordinating board standards. And there's two primary reasons for that. The major one is the fact that in the physics building right now, the physics building will contain approximately 13,300 net square feet of shell space in the initial construction phase. And we've been carrying that on our application as unassignable space. So that has driven the efficiency of that particular building down. When that space is completed, the component will meet coordinating board standards for a space which will contain a good portion will be laboratory space. The other primary contributing factor to that is the Institute building. This building is being constructed primarily with gift funds from the Mitchells. The intent of this building is to be an icon building, a unique building, which will be the center of the physics complex and as such will contain significant lobby pre-function reception areas to facilitate hosting receptions, pre-function areas, exhibits, and symposia. The building is being designed with a central atrium up and down the entire building, which requires or precludes a double loading of the corridor space around the building. And the requirement is from the physics group to have a connection. This is just one floor plan. Third floor plan is an example of how that space lays out. But there's a connection at all floor levels back to the physics building, which all of this results in a building efficiency that would be a little bit less than what would be normally attainable. But it's meeting the intent of the donors and the users to have a facility which will be a central gathering place, a central place to hold symposia, and an icon show place for the physics department to use. Can I ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. How big is that facility? I don't have it. I don't really know the volume of it. Well, the available space, not up and down, but just on the floor. Square footage on the floor. Yeah. Let me see if I can get that for you. I've got some numbers here. I don't know that right off the top of my head, but I'll see if I can find that answer. But anyway, this is a construction of the space. The university was recently allocated $6 million of permanent university funds, PUF funds, for this project to help address the additional user requested facilities, which would increase the project budget from $57 million to $63 million. And then there's a $63 million budget, and the gross square footage for the project exceeds the original board approved amount by more than 10%. We're requesting reapproval of the project. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. This does meet four out of the five standards. The one it does not meet, as Mr. Kennedy alluded to, is number three on efficiency. However, if that 13,000 square feet is built out, then it's a city. I understand that will meet our efficiency standards. So 
regardless of the issues on the atrium part. So any questions, Mr. Kenney? Any other questions? Do you have some information there that might involve Mr. Hill's question? I'll look through this, and I'll try to get the information as soon as I can find it. You need that? I did not know that oval area there. We can make sure that this is going to go to the full board, and we'll make sure that we have that information. We can certainly get that information. I just did not have it. No problem. These next items are all recommendations of the board, so between now and January, it would be helpful to have that. Do you have a question? You mentioned that Michael Graves and Associates was on direct contract with the donor. Is that correct? That's correct. Is that architectural fee, which is now $4.9 million, is that part of the gift or in addition to? It's part of the gift. Part of the $10 million? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Other questions? Chair, I'll entertain a motion. This is a recommendation to the board. Ms. Neal makes a motion. Mr. Foster seconds that motion to approve this request. Any other discussion or questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We do need to note, I think, for the record, that the Board of Regents, what I guess last week, met and approved this, and we have received the certificate. Friday, December the 1st, they met and approved the project at that funding at the $63 million inflation level. Thank you. Okay. The next item is the University of Texas has two projects. The first one is to construct utility infrastructure project phase two. Steve Crowell, is that correct, Crowell, is here to provide an overview of this project, of these projects. Good morning. Good morning. I'm pleased to be here. If you'd go to the next slide, please. This project, as your briefing notes will, or briefing sheet will indicate, this part is phase two of a two-phase project. The first phase is noted in your sheet. That was completed in 2002. The energy cost recovery on that project is currently ahead of schedule. We're paying that project off at the current rate and be paid off in about 18 years, and we anticipate the same level of success with this project. The overall project goals are to allow us to continue to meet our campus energy requirements, particularly related to power and chilled water. Our goal is to increase overall plant efficiency. We've been operating in the high 69 to 72 percent efficiency range, and we actually achieved 75 percent overall efficiency this summer, and we hope our ultimate goal is about 80 percent efficiency in our combined heat and power operation. Last year, two years ago, we received an EPA award for combined heat and power operations, a national award for the efficiency of our plant. We want to improve reliability. The power plant is an essential element of maintaining effective operations on campus for teaching and research, and our ability to operate without outages is a key factor in our ability to maintain essential research functions. We intend to fund this project within the existing utility budget, not adding any cost to institutional operations, and we will integrate it with our impending demand-side reduction efforts. Next slide, please. This slide shows you the overall cost savings and energy savings that we conservatively estimate for this project. It consists of four elements, the replacement of a 1960s-era gas turbine generator and heat recovery unit, the installation of peaking generators, upgrading our existing chiller plant, recycling equipment in those facilities by modernizing them, and then installing a chilled water tank to store chilled water. The peaking generators and chilled water tank are installed. The intent of those projects is to lower our peak requirements, peak energy requirements, allowing our equipment to operate in its most energy-efficient profile. You can see that we estimate 484,000 MMBTUs of savings at $8 an MMBTU purchased gas. That's about $3.9 million a year in savings. 
that exceeds our debt service requirements for that project. The next slide shows you kind of where we're located. The chilling stations that we'll be addressing are at the top of the screen, chilling station 5 up near the bend in the creek, and chilling station 4 on the eastern edge of the campus near the law school. And then the blue areas, PPE, PPL, and then a very small PPA, PP Annex. That building didn't get colored in. That's actually where the turbine will go. Very interesting here on turbines. The turbine that we have can be repaired. It will cost about $2.5 million. It has both turbine problems and generator problems. These are actually three pieces of equipment, a jet engine that we strap down onto the floor. That jet engine spins a generator, and then we recover the exhaust heat out of the jet engine essentially with a boiler. And we'll be replacing all three of those pieces of equipment. We have both repair and aging problems with all three of those elements. They can be replaced and repaired, but current equipment is so much more efficient that I didn't make a large point of this, but the gas turbine replacement is 394, almost 400,000 MMBTUs of savings, and that's at a five-month operating profile. We're actually going to increase the size of the turbine. Everything is larger in terms of productivity in the same footprint. So the turbine efficiency now is so much higher that we can go from 15 to 25, and everything stays the same size. So there really is no economic advantage to repairing anything that we have at that stage. So that gives you an idea of where we'll be working on this project in relation to the campus as a whole. And I think that's the last slide. No, here's the project funding. The revenue bonds, all of these will be repaid by energy savings. The annual debt service is 3.3, annual savings 3.9, and that's assuming that we can continue to buy gas at $8 an MMBTU. The break-even point on this project, gas has to go below $6.50 for us to not break even on this project. So we have a fairly large comfort range here where we'll be continuing to exceed debt service. Annual savings estimated at net savings in the range of $600,000 a year. And that is the last slide. Thank you, Mr. Crowell. Any questions for Mr. Crowell? This meets all five standards of the coordinating board. Again, this is a matter that's up for consideration for recommendation to the full board. What's the consideration of the committee? We have some moves to approve. We have a second. Shall we fill a second? Any other discussions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Crowell. Thank you. Okay, the next item is the second item from the University of Texas, is to re-approve and renovate Darrell K. Royal Stadium and expansion. John Richling is here from the University of Texas. I assume this is going to be one seat capacity less than Kyle Field. But a bigger screen. A bigger screen. I saw your bigger screen. I enjoyed what I saw on your bigger screen. He fell right into that. Proceeding. We'd like to do it at the right time. This is the campus map of the University of Texas at Austin, and the stadium is ever more physically in the center of the campus. It's a little hard to see that particular footprint, but it is a drawing of the stadium as it exists now. Let's go to the next slide. I can talk a little better. And let's do one more, which will be an overlay. There we go. Right now, the north end of the stadium is a holdover from the horseshoe days when there was a running track in the stadium. That was moved 10 or 12 years ago over to the Myers Stadium, and seating was lowered on the east and west side. The south end of the stadium is off the record right now. We will not be building that for quite a few years. But the north end, we're going to take down 
and build back much closer to the north end zone line and build out here with seating and club boxes and so on, much as we did the east side ten years ago. This project you have seen up until here. Let's go to the next slide. This is a rendering of the north end as it will be seen when the project is complete. Let's move to the next slide. From the inside, moving on, the section through the north end is shown here, and whereas right now the front row of seating is back here, it will move forward. Concourse area, television trucks and commissary on the northwest corner of it, some athletics spaces here, club seating and so on with an upper deck wrapping around from the east side. One of the issues that we're proposing here is to build in the seventh floor slab because it will never be cheaper to build it than right now, although we're not going to finish it out and occupy it. Likewise, as we do excavation, we will dig down and create shell space for a future four gymnasium, which will not be finished out at this point in time. So those issues plus utility costs that were found as we tied into and moved the city of Austin utility systems around the site, cost escalation, and I believe quite a few other issues that are in your briefing sheet are why we're coming to you today to ask for your participation with us in adding and taking the $149 million project up to $176. Fire protection increase was found necessary. We've talked about the basements, the additional space, which if those projects go over $2 million, we'll be back to talk to you about finishing those out at appropriate times. We also brought in some additional temporary bleachers for the Ohio State and A&M game this year, and we need to keep them in place on the south end until the project we're talking about here is totally finished in August of 2008. Let's move on to the next slide. Mr. Bruce, before you get away from that, is this going to tie the upper decks? Will this tie into the upper decks on both sides? Yeah, the upper decks will be tied together on all three sides, not the south end. What level is level seven? Well, level seven is right here, and because the site slopes up from west to east, you'll be going up one tall story, one more. I think this starts at something like level four right here relative to the far west side, so seven is right in there. Thank you. Go ahead. Financing, or I should say the source of funding. Next slide, please. We've talked about the unforeseen conditions, increase in construction costs, life safety issues, and scope adjustment having to do with the temporary seating, the spaces that we're shelling out, and so on. Next slide, please. Any questions or comments of Mr. Richling? Chair, this does meet the five standards again of the coordinating board, and this again is a recommending, this will be a recommendation of the full board. I have a motion. Motion, Mr. Neal, second by Mr. Ransom. Any other comments or discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. We invite you back in two years. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Our next item is to construct a physical science engineering core facility phase one at the University of Texas at El Paso. Gregory McNichol and Cindy Villa, I believe, are here to give us an overview. Thank you. 
Good morning, Gregory. Primarily, today we're asking you to look at just phase one of a two-step, two-major step project. Phase two project, which is construction of a new physical science building, we'll be bringing to you at a later date. Okay, it's not, we're just getting started with the design phase of that one. What we're asking you to look at is $21 million worth of work that is a part of the first, it's part of the renovation to the existing facility. If you'll go on to the next slide. The first thing we're doing is re-roofing the entire engineering complex. This has gotten real important to us since August, to be quite honest. We found every leak there was, to be honest with you. So, the next slide, please, and actually go to. The second piece of this is replacing 35-year-old chillers that are currently in what we call, referred to as the central plant. This will actually somewhat complete some of the major renovations we've been doing over the several years of the chiller and hot water system on campus. And this will also be sized, of course, appropriately for the next future building, the new physical science building that will be coming at you at a later date. The next two slides, and then it goes through this, there we go. This one is a completion of the first floor annex building. This is a project we brought to you, again, about three years ago. And this completes the final shell floor that we have in the building. Next slide. And then, in general, we've got upgrading of miscellaneous equipment, a variety of equipment. This is a building, again, that was built in the early 70s. There's a lot of research and teaching equipment that needs to be upgraded. There's HVAC control systems, all those kinds of things. And so we're actively getting in there to bring this building up to snuff. Next slide. The last one that does probably have a little bit of question, I'll save this one to last, was we are going to be adding a clean room to the complex. This one, I think, does not meet your standard right now in the cost per square foot. I would like to point out that this is solely just a clean room and the associated mechanical equipment that goes with it. That does cause the cost per square foot to go, to look out of what you normally see. And I would also like to point out that normally clean rooms are kind of part of a whole bigger complex. And so the cost gets blended. And so you don't, it doesn't pop out quite like it does on this one. This one, I think, is coming in at $400 a square foot. I think we've made reference to a rice addition that was actually at $1,500 a square foot. UC Riverside has a similar project that I found on the internet. And then we've recently gotten some additional information that Dave Dixit can share from UT Austin has a nanotech facility that ran at $585 a square foot. And there's a UT Dallas project that's at $400 and I forget the last one. Let me ask Ms. Brown a question here on that because I have that marked as well. And I thought when we at one time, and I can't remember which project, I think it was the University of Texas project here in Austin, that we were going to look at these clean rooms and separate out a separate range independent of what would be our normal cost per square foot because those costs for those particular facilities don't run the norm. They don't. And what we are finding hard to do is because, as you said, that they are usually as part of the building as a whole. So those costs are distributed throughout and it's harder for them to separate out those clean room costs into a special line item. But I think if there is a clean room involved in the construction facility, though, we ought to have a separate range in those kind of facilities that we need to be looking at because I just don't think this is realistic to expect these institutions to meet this kind of cost range on clean rooms. So we need to take a look at that. And so I would mark that as well. But this, again, we're not approving construction of projects here. We're approving the evaluation for purposes of TRVs. So, again, this is a recommendation to the full board. Anybody have any other slides that you want to add? I think that was the last one. Okay. Any questions of Mr. McNichol? Okay. Chair, I'll entertain a motion. Senator, I'll make a motion. Mr. Olmfeld, second. This does meet four out of the five standards with the exception of the cost standard on a clean room. That was the discussion we just had. So any other comments or questions? I'll fire the motion to recommend the full board approval. Signify by saying aye. Follow the same sign. Motion carries. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. The next item is, we've got this as reapproval day. This next item is a request to reapprove 
construction student housing expansion phase two Laurel Village. And again, this is at the University of Texas, San Antonio. And Charles Lampe, are you here? Charles Lampe. Charles is here to speak on behalf of the project. Good morning. Good morning. You know, we're excited about the possibilities of adding to our Roadrunner Cafe that was brought online in conjunction with our phase one housing, Chaparral Village. Incidentally, we just started mobilization for our Laurel Village project this week that we're, you know, excited about. And that will be an additional 680 beds that you previously approved. And we're back today with that Laurel Village to add the expansion of our Roadrunner Cafe addition. Currently, we have our site location, you know, to give you a little, Chaparral Village, which is our thousand bed project, is sited right here with adjacent to Chisholm Hall, our privatized dorm facility. And then our new Laurel Village project is located just to the east. And our Roadrunner Cafe is located centrally to those complexes. Specifically, the blue is the addition to the Roadrunner Cafe. Currently, we have a thousand beds at Chaparral Village that are required to be on a board plan. And as of today, we have 1,800 board plan participants. With the additional 680 beds in Laurel Village, they will also be required to be a part of the board plan. So we will be having 2,480 students participating in the board plan. We recently completed a campus food services master plan. And this addition is consistent with the results of that master plan to provide the additional food serving turns for this facility. Just to, you know, I don't know if any of you have seen our campus in Chaparral Village, but here's a rendering of our Chaparral Village project in approximate Roadrunner Cafe. The expansion will be out to the east at this location. Just to briefly give you an overview, the existing Roadrunner Cafe has two dining areas, a central servery, kitchen, toilet rooms, and mechanical space in the back. This addition will span and add to the east of this facility. We will, currently there is a private dining room that is used for special events and functions that will be converted to servery that will expand the servery. And we will be doing some additional enhancements to provide additional serving features in the facility. We will have a separate entry, storage facilities, and car storage, you know, to supplement the storage in the existing Roadrunner Cafe. We will have restroom facilities and then a new dining hall that will be, the program has developed the requirement to be able to separate and compartmentalize, you know, for after hours use of this facility. So we will have the benefit to supplement housing, meeting rooms, you know, with additional space in this facility. This gives you an elevation of the expansion as it relates to Roadrunner Cafe. And, you know, it's consistent with the design for the building. You know, that really concludes our presentation, you know, in an effort to be brief here. You know, we seek your approval for this, for this expansion. Thank you, Mr. Lampe. The, it does meet four out of the five. The one issue is critical deferred maintenance and staff recommendation is approval, but with continued monitoring of what the institution is doing related to critical deferred maintenance. And Ms. Brown, I understand we are satisfied with the progress that they're making in that area. I also, Mr. Lampe, would comment we've had an issue in San Antonio about cost per square foot, and I see that you're under the range. I commend you on that. Well, actually, you know, you know, of course, we've had some dialogue in past meetings, but, you know, we do have a CM at risk on board. 
you know, and, you know, for the Laurel Village expansion, they will be handling this. And so we were able to, we were managing our costs and trying and keeping them. And I don't want to come back to you on this one at all. I understand. You are pretty marginal. We appreciate your support, you know, and the effort that you made to get us to this point. Very good. Chair will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, Mr. Hellenfeld's motion, second by Mr. Foster. Any other comments or discussion? Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, motion uh, opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Lansing. Okay, the next item is from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. It's again a reapproval of construct replace research facility. Uh, Gerald Martin is here, I believe from UT Health Science Center to provide some input. Thank you. Uh, well, Mr. Adams, um, I, I don't have a presentation or anything. I've been That's here, fine. Uh, a couple of times, and actually uh, in the last meeting we were in, um, down in uh, Brownsville. Right. We talked about this and we're uh, trying to get it. Uh, we basically have a change in funding uh, at this level, and we're going from gift funds uh, that was originally proposed uh, in this facility and we're going to a revenue finance system and so there's a combination of revenue finance system and also PUF, uh, permanent university funds that have been acquired uh, for the project and so we are here um, uh, to change the funding source and this will be the yeah, final leg on yeah, this project. Yeah, approval of evaluation on construction. We actually approved the, the project at $80,530,000 back in the uh, in October of 06, I believe. Um, so again, this is a recommendation to the board um, based on a change in funding sources. Carolina, take a motion. Ms. Neal makes a motion. Mr. Ransom seconds. <coughs> Any other comments or discussions? All in favor of the motion, say aye. Uh, all opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. And the next or the last item that we have to consider related to approval to the board is from the University of Texas uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center um, to, um, uh, again, to construct the uh, Center for Advanced Biomedical Imaging Research. And Susan Lipke is here. Good morning. Morning. I feel like I'm at a Senate hearing or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm here today to present the third building within our research park, uh, the Center for Advanced Bi Biomedical Research Imaging. Uh, the objectives of this are to reduce our current uh, shortage of research space. Uh, we're at about 600,000, a little under that in the formula with, with the board here. Um, this building is going to focus on advanced uh, imaging technology, both in a preclinical and clinical stages. There will be some patient areas in this building to facilitate that. This is a partnership with GE Health Research, their healthcare research component, as well as the two floors of this building will be occupied by UT Houston Health Science Center. Those are the program details. The programs that will be in there for MD Anderson are experimental diagnostic imaging, imaging physics are in there, uh, and then the general electric healthcare and their staff and health science center. Uh, really dedicated to looking at a lot of the isotope production. There is a cyclotron in this building to support the PET scanners and some of the research happening there. It will be a beta test site for some of the pharmaceuticals, radiopharmaceuticals, um, and as I mentioned earlier, some clinical testing with those radiopharmaceuticals. There's a lot of short life isotopes which require, uh, especially with PET scanning, for the patient to be almost directly adjacent to the cyclotron and the production of those isotopes. Uh, the advantage to that is, is that because they're such a short life and they're so expensive, you can reduce that cost to the patient and improve the imaging technology. A uh, little bit about the building details. It is a six-story building. It's a concrete structure, uh, 315,000 gross square feet to that. It's a combination of brick and curtain wall. Uh, I've listed that there are two, uh, two areas in here, shelf floors, both for MD Anderson and Health Science Center. And then the major pieces of equipment in the first phase of this are a cyclotron, a combination of a PET scanner and CT, uh, a spec CT combo, uh, just a CT scanner and magnetic resonance imaging. We're also planning on the first floor of this on the site. Uh, there'll eventually be a seven Tesla magnet on this site also. Sure. How much of the cost is the major equipment? 
the uh, a lot of the equipment is a good part of the cost in this first phase. Uh, we uh, anticipate starting construction in February. Uh, uh, PNW Architects out of Houston have done the design. Uh, Vaughn Construction is our CM at risk. Uh, anticipate substantial completion in July of 09 and then start moving in and operating the building in the fall of 09. Uh, the budget is 88 million uh, gross square feet cost on total project cost are $280 uh, dollars a square foot. Funding sources are 30 million from grants, another 25 million dollars is from gifts, and then 33 million of this is coming from uh, local revenue uh, from the patient care revenue. Uh, this is the site on our south campus. If you're familiar with Houston, this is um, Old Spanish Trail, the fan in here to the south. These uh, are the first buildings that you that are up and running that you have approved that are part of the research park. This is the site for the Kabir. Uh, I'd also like to mention at this, we've planned this site so that there are companion buildings that could be added to this looking at our long-term needs. And the next building on this site is the Center for Targeted Therapies, and I'll be coming back to you next year. We've just kicked off the design selection for that project and we're looking at a, a fifth building on the site here probably within the next 18 months. This is a rendering of the building. You can see it's consistent with the architecture we've had on that campus of a combination of brick and curtain wall. This is a one-story uh, entry and waiting and holding area for patients. It's in an aluminum uh, finish to it with a, a brick and a little raised entry there. The future building uh, that I mentioned, the Center for Targeted Therapies, will, uh, sit, will fit in right behind this and snug up to the building. And then uh, these are the floor plans. This uh, predominantly on the first floor, this is all the cyclotron and the radioisotope support of that, which you see in the light blue are all the patient care areas. This is future for animal holding with a lot of the research that will happen in this area, again related to the pharmace radio pharmaceuticals and the cyclotron. The, uh, the typical, the second floor, these are a lot of wet labs uh, that are happening in this area with the physicist and uh, equipment rooms and things that are happening in there. This is shell space for future laboratory. And then building, the rest of the building three through five um, are shelled out for future research building. The top two floors will be dedicated to Health Science Center. They are planning a clean room. Um, and I, I can share some information with Susan. Our premium just in the foundation to support because there will be a large clean room on this area was a premium of about $700,000 to the foundations of the building to support all the mechanical equipment that's going to have to go on the roof to that. So we did plan for that and um, so it, it can be substantial in looking at what some of those costs are. The other thing that you'll see in this building is that we have uh, planned as far as the circulation that we can con uh, connect to the second building that I mentioned on here so that the researchers will be able to go back and forth between the two buildings. And I'm open for questions. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lepka. Any questions? Uh, this does uh, recommendation staff is approval. It does meet our five standards, the coordinating board. And this is, again, a recommendation to the full board. I have a motion. Ms. Neal makes a motion. Mr. Ransom seconds. Any other comments or questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Lipson. Thank you. Have a nice holiday. You do, thank you. Okay. The next five projects are for approval uh, by this committee. The first is to reapprove construct uh, activities, building, expansion, and renovation phase one for the University of Texas at Arlington. And John Hall, I believe, is here to, to address that issue. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a, uh, a project that you all approved in June uh, 2006. The total project cost of 30 million. The total project cost is now 34.5 million. Uh, no scope changes, all driven. Uh, the, the cost increase is all driven by uh, the increases that we're all experiencing in the construction uh, industry. To reacquaint you with the, with the project, we have the uh, the site plan. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the UT Arlington campus, this is Cooper Street that runs north and south through the campus. 
the current activities building and so this area depicts the eighty three thousand square foot addition and then the project also includes a renovation of about a hundred and two thousand existing square feet i've got a couple of elevation shots to share with you all this is the the new addition on the east side of the building that represents the eighty two thousand eighty three thousand square foot addition this is an interior shot uh... the the uh... description of the of the project the eighty three thousand square foot addition will include a new fitness center space a fitness track uh... social areas internet cafe area for students additional training and office space as well as additional basketball courts and then the renovation is uh... A new entrance element, uh, renovations to existing locker facilities and existing gymnasiums are in the building. This building was built in 1977, has not gone through any extensive renovations since that date. So here's a breakdown of, of the budget. You'll see that construction makes up about uh, 26 million. The increase of 4.5 million in the TPC is uh, is based on an increase of about 2.7 million construction costs and then the balance of soft costs. Uh, we are still, as, as we mentioned to you all back in June, we're still, uh, we will still accomplish uh, addressing deferred maintenance of a little more than 1.1 million, which represents replacement of the existing mechanical systems that has been reported in the past as part of our accumulated deferred maintenance on this, on this building. Uh, we've gone through extensive value engineering exercises. We came up with about 57 items for consideration that totaled about $1.8 million, of which about a little over half a million uh, the building ad hoc committee approved uh, or accepted about uh, 500,000 of those VE items. Entertain any questions that you all might have. you have any questions, Mr. Hall? This is a reapproval, uh, actually from April of 06, um, and it does meet all five standards of the coordinating board, and the staff's recommendation is approval. Do I have a motion? Mr. Grant's a motion. Mr. Foster, second. Any other comments or questions? All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you. Okay, the next item is from the University of Texas. It uh, has two projects for committee approval. The first is, is an application to purchase 1616 Guadalupe. Jim Wilson is here to address this issue. Thank you, sir. Um, we had a, a unique opportunity at UT Austin to purchase uh, a major, what I will call, institutional office building. It was the former headquarters, of, uh, regional headquarters for Southwestern Bell Telephone. Uh, in August, a uh, local developer came to us who was buying the property that uh, was going to gut it completely and rebuild it as a Class A office building. When we, look, we wanted to lease part of it to us because they know we leased a lot of property. Uh, when we looked at the building, we thought it had so many unique features that might help us, and it was so close to campus. We entered into negotiations, and now we are uh, trying to purchase that property. The property is located about three and a half blocks southwest of the campus, um, 1616 Guadalupe. This red stick pin on the map shows the location. Next slide, please. If you look back to the campus from the sixth floor of the building, those two cranes are today constructing the new executive education and conference center. That's three blocks, three and a half blocks away. Humanities Research Center is four blocks away, and the tower itself is six blocks away. So it's, it's very close. Uh, very well connected by transit, uh, Capital Metro, which the students can drive, ride, and the faculty and staff can get permits, runs uh, down Guadalupe and then uh, back up Lavaca. And then the UT shuttle system runs within two blocks on either side of the building. Next slide, please. The site is a full city block. It's 1.761 acres of land. There are no out parcels. Uh, there are no alleys. There are no easements. It's very clean. The office building is 253,087 gross square feet. First three floors in the basement were <coughs> built in, finished in 1963. The upper four floors in the penthouse were completed in 1977. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the really attractive features of this property is it has a seven-story parking garage uh, with some 263,500 approximately square feet. 
of space. Those seven floors are arranged into 13 ramps, the way the ramp system is put together. Today, it has approximately 540 parking spaces. We believe we could increase that substantially if we needed to because those are very wide, inefficient parking spaces. Next slide, please. This is the main entrance to the building off of Guadalupe. I must say it doesn't look like that today. When everybody moved out, it looks a little bit rougher than that. This is the main hallway that goes through the building back into the parking garage. But the center core right in the middle is the elevator core and services in the entire building. The intended uses for this, and one of the reasons it was so attractive to us because it can serve a number of needs. First of all, we have a pressing need for faculty and research space within the core of campus. The administration's intention that we will move a lot of offices, administrative back office functions, away from the core of campus into this building. My office will move there immediately after we buy it. For instance, I'm in the Fawn Academic Center. That will create a lot of opportunity for reassignment for academic purposes. When we either tear down or remodel existing buildings, we have a real problem with surge space while those projects are being done. We can't move wet laboratories into this, but we can move an awful lot of people into this building because it can be configured in a lot of ways. The third function is we lease way too much space in Austin, Texas for research projects, temporary projects, and even administrative functions. We hope to terminate as many of those leases as quickly as we can, move those into this facility. New leases will not happen. They will go into this facility. So we'll have a lot of recovery there, which we intend to apply towards the debt service. And lastly, the parking garage will serve more than the users of this building. With a campus with some 70,000 people a day on it and only 15,000 parking spaces, every parking space we can get is critical. And not only the people that move away from the center, but other people will use this. The revenues gained from those permits and use fees will be used to retire the debt service on that portion of the project. Next slide, please. The building has multiple uses. This is the old law library for Bell on the sixth floor. We were very fortunate when Bell was moving out. I said, wait a minute, what are you doing with that? We're taking most of it and giving it away. So all the furnishings you see here, they have left in the building, and we will obtain at no cost if we close on this. Next slide, please. This is a typical office suite on the sixth floor with perimeter single-person offices with bullpens outside those offices. And once again, these furnishings come with it. Next slide. There's a lot of landscape furniture in large open spaces. Unfortunately, some of that was taken away so that there are some large spaces, next slide, that are open and vacant today. But that can either be refurnished with landscape furniture or even finished out with individual offices based on the needs of the units that we put in there. This particular space was once a data center for Southwestern Bell, and it's certainly not the reason we're pursuing the building, but it is actually under consideration in the current feasibility study as a potential site for the UT Austin data center, which would further bring other facilities off campus into this. It's a large building with a good-sized parking garage at far, far below replacement cost and really meets a number of immediate needs. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I commend you for this. I think these are the kind of things that all the institutions ought to be looking for in close proximity to their campuses because this obviously creates some major efficiencies for you and what you can do on campus and relieve other spaces and needs for faculty. I know I would point out to the board, the committee on page 2 under the standard cost, you had two current appraisals, purchase prices under both of those, and obviously the replacement cost would be significant if you were to even look at that. So there are only two standards that are really applicable to this type of project, and it meets both of those. This is a recommended approval by the staff, and this is for committee approval. Yes, ma'am. This is for the purchase price only, is that right? Yes. No, this has happened so quickly we have not really had time to. We have had a complete building assessment done. We've begun analyzing. We will move into the lower four floors immediately, and one of the things that we have obtained approval from the state fire marshal's office is to occupy those four 
floors because the building is not sprinkled, but we have to complete the sprinkling process within five years. So we won't occupy the upper floors. We'll do those as we go along. There's a lot of old systems here, but we'll handle those the same way we handle maintenance of the building I'm in now. It's the same age building. So we will put it in the inventory, but we have very little time to react to this opportunity. And you have it under contract, as I understand? We have it under contract. If you approve it, we'll buy it within three weeks. Okay. And is there any asbestos abatement necessary? Not necessary unless we disturb some of the floor tiles. It will go into our standard asbestos management plan as we do on the entire campus. Do you have an estimated figure on the amount of savings in your lease space that you'll realize on an annual basis? There's an aging problem there or issue there. We currently spend more than $2 million a year to lease space. Some of that is specialty space for heavy and scientific work. We would hope to reduce that by more than $1 million and pull it into this lease. But some of that will take several years because this was simply not anticipated before end of August. Those leases will have to run out over time. Other questions or comments? Okay. What's the pleasure of the committee? Approval. Mr. Allenfeld makes a motion to approve. Mr. Foster seconds. Any other comments or discussions? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much. The second project for the University of Texas to re-approve and construct a research office complex. This is apparently in our golden rod colored material. It's a supplementary to the agenda material. There has been some revisions. Closing the gaps goal has been changed to reflect the research goal. A copy of the revised briefing sheets with that change are highlighted. And Mr. Richling is back to address us on this project. Thank you for having me back. This is a project at our Pickle Research Campus. It's re-approval of the research office complex. The project at one time was known as the Institute for Geophysics and Advanced Computing Center. And I put the word Texas in there because you will see the phrase TACC used as we talk about this project. Next slide, please. This is on the Pickle Research Campus in northwest Austin. Mopac running north. Breaker Lane across the top. Burnett Road on the east side. And Commons facility in about the center of the campus. A geology building up here. A project that you have seen before is to add a three-story building on the south side of that, which would hold Texas Advanced Computing and the Institute for Geophysics. We recently dedicated, let's back up just a little bit here. We recently dedicated in this building a supercomputer installation upgrade in that building, which allows the researchers to go up to 55 teraflops. Now, before I got into this project, I thought teraflops would be footwear. But it is indeed a topic of conversation and measure. And I do have the assistant director for TACC with me today. If you have further questions here, she can possibly answer. Janet McCord. What's a teraflop? What's a teraflop? We intend to take the new building. Now we have an opportunity to, with the reapproval, to take it up to 400 teraflops. So this gives us quite an opportunity here to make a large leap. Next slide, please. The research office complex is nearing construction. We're actually moving furniture in as we speak. People are preparing to move into the building. It's shared between the two organizations. And when we talked to you about it previously, it was a $20,444,000 total project cost. Next slide, please. On the ground floor, Texas TACC will occupy the entire ground floor with offices, a nice size auditorium, and then the computer room is here. 
using local cooling units provided by chilled water from the main campus, but it completes our chilled water availability on the Pickle campus as we're finishing it today to feed these computer room air conditioning projects. It also is provided by power from the city of Austin. Next slide, please. In September of this year, the National Science Foundation made a five-year, $59 million award to TACC, of which or for which this project is providing support, providing the physical support to that NSF award. Next slide, please. What we're doing is moving those cooling units around within here and providing additional electrical gear here of switches, power distribution units, and then because we no longer have chilled water available for this project or the increase in the project from the central chilling station, we're providing new chilling units here using the electrical power. And this does create a project in the upper left-hand corner increase of $13.9 million total project cost in addition to the $20.44. And that is the last slide, and Ms. McCord or I are available to answer questions. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Grisham. Any questions for Ms. Grisham? Teraflop is. I beg your pardon? Got to know what a teraflop is. A billion operations per second. A billion? A trillion. A trillion operations per second. That's pretty fast. Teraflop. So 400 teraflops is 400 trillion operations per second. That's a bunch. That's a bunch. Any other astute questions? Do you know what a teraflop is? I didn't say I did. I didn't want to ask. I thought it was an astute question. Any other questions of any kind? Chair, I'll entertain a motion. Ms. Foster, motion. Ransom, second. Any other questions or comments? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. The next project is from the University of Texas at El Paso to re-approve construct a biosciences facility. Again, Gregory is back with us. Good morning once again. I'll introduce you to this project again, just for those that aren't familiar with it. We came back in. There's a slide in here that will give you a timeline on it. The project is located right here in the core of the campus. It's a biosciences research building. Next slide. Sorry, next one. Next one. This is kind of an area of plan. The current existing biology building is off to the right here. Dell Hall is where the Dean of Science is located, and this building is the one that you're seeing here. Three of the five floors will be actually accepted on Friday of this week. Next slide. This is what the exterior elevation looks like. Next slide. Okay, next. Okay. First phase was constructed and completed in November of 2004. It was a shell building then. We were holding back money because we were going after an NIH grant that you'll see that actually did get awarded. Next slide. The next point. Phase two is being accepted this month, as I mentioned. It will anticipate that we'll complete the whole building with your all's approval by December of next year. Okay. Initial approval occurred in October of 2002. Reapproval occurred in March of 2005, and this is when we added the NIH money primarily, and there was additional PUF money that was added to the project at that time. And the second request of a reapproval is basically adding $9 million of PUF money that will allow us to complete the third, the rest of the second floor, and construct one more BSL-3 suite within the building. And it does meet your efficiencies. And it's a good timing right now. This is a construction manager at risk project. We are able to kind of keep the contractor moving. And, of course, these are all the segments of all the work will actually get rebid so that we'll keep it competitive in that nature. Who is the CM? Vaughn Construction. 
And the reason for the big increase in fixed equipment is because you're actually – you're using this opportunity to fill out what was previously shelf space. Is that right? Correct. And then to go ahead and – now that we're bringing on the researchers that, you know, as this project – we're able to go ahead and purchase the proper equipment as it takes to equip it up and get the labs turned on, if you will. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. McNichol? Okay. This is a recommendation for approval by the staff for evaluation purposes. It does meet the five standards according to the Board of Works and Pleasures Committee. Foster moves for approval. Mr. Ransom seconds the motion. Any other comments or discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All those saying sign the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with the project. Okay. The last item for the committee's consideration today is from the University of Texas San Antonio to purchase land on Loop 1604. We're also part of that gold rod. I believe the last couple of pages deal with this issue as a substitute for standard number five, I believe. Those briefing sheets were revised. And Mr. Lumpy is back with us. Charles? Good morning again. I'd like to let you know that Mr. Kerry Kennedy, our Vice President for Business Affairs, is in attendance. And also we have Florence Main UT System here in case you have any technical questions for the transaction. You know, we're seeking approval to purchase a 124.78 acre track of land located on the southeast side of Loop 1604 and the north side of Houseman Road in San Antonio. The 1604 campus lies here just to the east or the northeast of the property. I-10 is situated here. Loop 1604 is here. Houseman Road is this principal road here. And, of course, we also have UTSA Boulevard in the area. Carl Sill Parkway, which is located just to, you know, the north of this property and actually ties into 1604 at, you know, bisecting the property. This gives you an aerial photo showing the property location approximate. In this area, you know, as I said, you know, 1604 is the north border. And then we have UTSA Boulevard, Babcock Road, and then Houseman Road, you know, has access to the south end of the property. And we have access to Loop 1604. The current UTA campus is not on that slide. It's back. UTSA campus is right here. Oh, is that it? Yes, sir. Okay. You know, that shows, you know, the previous site plan, you know, is kind of distorted. But, you know, seeing this aerial really makes it approximate to the campus because it is less than a mile from the campus. And then, of course, we have our east campus. You know, primarily, you know, we have floodplain and future building site here. And then we have west campus in our central core. For reference, Roadrunner Cafe is right there. What is between this proposal? We have a housing subdivision right here, substantial size. You know, and that's one of the issues, you know, is, you know, why do we need this land? And we can go back to that slide if we need to. You know, our 2004 master plan identified a 65-acre deficit, you know, when the campus was fully built out. And this is assuming 30,000 student head count. We're at 28, you know, exceeding 28. And we're looking now for our 2016 strategic plan at 35,000. You know, so that further complicates, you know, the need for space. You know, this land, by utilizing this land, you know, we will free up approximately 60 acres on the central campus core that can be utilized for future academic research facilities, parking, student housing, and other items, you know, that could be concentrated central to the campus with additional facilities to be moved to this other land. Potential land options for this includes remote parking, academic research facilities, recreation, intramural fields, 
or possibly even a facilities maintenance complex. One thing I'd like to point out that, you know, our floodplain and environmental situation on our 1604 campus, and this is astounding, but between our recharge features, our water quality basins, our endangered species areas, you know, where we have a preserve, there are almost 112 acres on our 1604 campus that we cannot use or develop. And so that further complicates the, you know, you said you have 600 acres, you know, well, you ought to be able to utilize that. But, you know, the environmental constraints have really pressed the need to acquire additional land. And, you know, incidentally, that's approximately 20 percent of our 1604 campus that is not buildable. Is all of the new land usable? We, out of the 124, it's approximately 117 acres of that. There is some floodplain through there, but it is manageable and, you know, really will not, you know, preclude us to develop. And also, you know, we will need to utilize that. And, you know, we're still in Aquifer area with a new land since it's approximate to the campus. So we will be doing, working with TCEQ to, you know, to manage the water runoff in that facility. Actually, we'll probably enhance the property, you know, for future runoff because we will be detaining it when we develop and cleaning it up. The other thing is that, you know, this is, can we go back to the previous, the previous slide? This is a prime location. And, you know, development in this area, as you can already see, all the residential, our campus, the shops at La Cantera, we've got hotels and residential, you know, they're not making any more land. And, you know, this is one of the last large tracts of property available to the UTSA campus. You know, so it is apparent that we really need to get a hold of this land as soon as possible because, from what I understand, that developers are standing in line to purchase it if we don't. You know, so, you know, we're under, you have it under contract? Well, the contracts are under negotiation. You know, we really have to get through this approval to go forward. But, you know, and Florence can address technical issues if you want to ask as far as the real estate transaction. Okay. Any questions or comments for Mr. Lansing? Again, I think, you know, if you look at, and I asked Ms. Brown in terms of the, it was a 64-acre deficit, even if you had to build out the current campus, and that takes into account the current land they already own that's vacant. So they're going to be deficit to meet those standards. And that was at 30,000 students. Exactly. And not 35,000 students. So this, and of course, if you look at the appraisals, this is well within the appraised value for that property. Any other comments or questions? Again, this is for committee approval. It's a pleasure to meet you. Mr. Ransom, motion for approval. Ms. Neal, second. Any other comments or questions? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those same motions carries. Thank you very much. You'll be left to you. Okay. Ms. Brown, do you want to officially introduce Mr. Johnstone to the committee? I'm remiss in not doing that earlier. And this is something we should have done. I'd like to introduce Mr. Gary Johnstone. He has been here since August. August. Not new anymore. So we've broken it in pretty well. He was with Brazos Port College for 23 years before coming to the coordinating board, and he has been a wonderful asset. He has a lot of experience in the finance area. And I wanted to let you know he's here. He was introduced at the last board meeting, but he has not been formally introduced to the committee. Welcome aboard, John and Gary. Appreciate you being here. Look forward to working with you. All right. Our next item on our agenda is over the past several months, resource planning staff have been meeting with representatives from various institutions to gather their input on coordinating board standards and policies to determine if there's any changes that are necessary. Jeff, Director of Finance and Resource Planning, will give us a brief update on the areas discussed by the facilities work group and what possible changes to standards and policies we need to make for this next year. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'd like to provide a brief 
overview of what we've been doing the past several months concerning these work groups and some of the standards that we have with the board. We initiated a series of meetings with various institutional representatives. The purpose was and is still to review the existing standards and the related analysis to assure that the existing standards are accurate, that they are fair representation of the planning operation of the state institutions, and that the spirit of the statutes is being fairly applied. The areas under review include the cost standard, the classroom and lab utilization standards, the deferred maintenance, efficiency, and also space need. An overall facilities group was formed consisting of system institutions, the independents, and then coordinating board staff members. And that was formed in order to gather information and brainstorm on these topics that I mentioned. Within that, we also developed some smaller work groups that was to get together and discuss further and have smaller groups to talk about these issues. And we invited many people for that. The idea was for the work groups to report back findings and recommendations to this overall steering group on these standards. The work groups that were developed are covering such areas as facilities inventory, which is the buildings themselves and the information that we gather on the inventory, building cost and replacement cost, and space and the space model. We've had discussions over these several months, and some of these topics have included the facilities reporting standard, including coding issues. We've talked about some technical issues with it of what could be changed in it. What does the institutions think is not working? What do we don't need to report on? And so we have included with past discussions the location code. We've included the zip code was an issue that's now being included. And also one change, too, is with room dimensions because of how we record process information from the institutions where we're getting really some information that we don't even use when we just need the total square feet. So some of those technical issues. We've been dealing with building cost. Let me stop you right there, Mr. Trickle. In terms of getting information we don't need, and we made that clear that we don't need it and they don't need to be providing it and wasting their time to do that. We have not sent out a formal letter or anything saying this is the new way. Is this information we're consistently getting from every institution or only a few institutions? We're getting it from all of the institutions right now. What we're doing is we're looking at making whole scale changes to that reporting requirement. And so instead of changing this one piece and changing another piece and changing another piece, we're going to get it all completed before we implement it. And all of the working groups that you've had have all had institutional members in working with the staff here to come up with these proposals. Okay. We've talked about building costs, specifically about the regional specific cost. We're still talking about that, but that is an issue that we like to get feedback on and see what we can do. Replacement cost. Currently, we are looking at the current method is looking at its E and G replacement cost. But we want to see is there a different way to do that. Deferred maintenance. We're trying to we want to evaluate the definition of deferred maintenance. So it's we we just need further clarification on deferred maintenance. But these are issues that we are still looking at and we still have other meetings to. We're clearly not done with the past. So we're still looking at what do we anticipate in terms of coming to the committee and ultimately the board with these recommendations? We would like to have it to the board for the July board meeting. Depending on what the legislative session does to everybody's schedule, it may get pushed off to October. But we will probably be bringing at least some of the recommendations forward to the board, at least informing you. Some of them are just reporting changes and we'll let you know about those. But they're not anything that you would need to approve. In terms of the in terms of the update, though, on the cost ranges, 
That's, that's not what we're talking about here. That's something that's a separate issue. That's a separate issue. That's automatically done. What we might um, bring forward to you is if we do find significant changes by individual region, mm -hmm. um, that we would bring to you and, and let you know that um, get your approval on how to present that and okay. what would be the most useful to the board. And then that obviously, the, the quicker we implement that, the better for everyone in terms of upgrading those ranges, cost ranges, because... Uh, and, and we update those every year, so we'll be updating in January, and, and what we're looking at that is how we can incorporate the regional... Okay, so, so we're, okay, we're upgrading the ranges as they current exist, yeah. and then what we're looking at is possibly breaking that down even further right. into the regional areas, right? right. Okay, good. Um, but that's basically it. All right, thank you, Mr. Trigger. Any other comments or questions, ma'am? Uh, yeah, yeah, I had a question, maybe more just educational for me. <clears throat> is, is this work group looking at classroom and class laboratory utilization uh, guidelines? Mm -hmm. and, and also, I was curious why the utilization guidelines don't fall into any of the five standards. Um, they used to, the classroom utilization used to be a standard. Um, there were so, there were only two institutions that met the standard, they, and so it was switched to a guideline back I don't know four couple years ago. Yeah, I don't I don't yeah, remember exactly when ago. it happened. What we're looking at <clears throat> currently the um, utilization standard only looks at the number of hours that the classroom is in use. It does not take into account. Um, how many students are in a classroom. So it didn't look at um, how efficiently those classrooms are being used in addition to just the fact that they're being used. So that's just one of the reasons. Hours of just in use. Hours per week. Right. One of the reasons so, it was removed, uh, uh, Fred, is because there was such a distortion in terms of reporting and we, uh, and we didn't do a very good job of defining what we were asking for. And so, so we're, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at that again. Yeah, so, so that's why my question is, is this work group looking, it seems like that's the important that criteria, is, that is we just need a better the, standard. That is one of the, the yeah. things that we're looking at. consistently ask us about that, yeah. and that's something we need to come back with. So. And we're, we're trying to get, like I said, not just the hours in use, but efficiency of those hours in use. We're also looking at uh, student station capacity as, as uh, that's been an item that's been brought up. Student station capacity? Actually, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that makes sense. I mean, we may come up with a system to stack students eventually. <laughs> but, uh, increase so. We've got to figure out a way to, to uh, take into account the informal students. Right, informal use. Yeah, yes. study groups and just go into an empty classroom and it's being used and it doesn't show up. We don't have that yeah. anywhere in our and technology and distance ed. You know, technology and distance and ed is also not included in there. So there's a lot of factors that go into that utilization, and we're trying to get all of those incorporated. Thank you, Mr. Trickle. Appreciate it. Um, next item, uh, of course, as I think most of you know, the legislature has added uh, through the Education Code authorizing three research centers. Susan Brown and, and Gary Johnstone are going to brief the committee on the current status of those research centers. Okay. Um, this came over to the coordinating board in September from the TEA, and we've been working with them. We have got a draft of the RFP and the interagency contract with TEA. Um, this group may not know what the educational okay. research centers are. Educational research centers are centers that will have access to um, public K through 12 and higher ed information down to the student level in a FERPA compliant, uh, Student Privacy Act compliant manner. Um, they will be able, they will do research, they will be funded up to a million dollars each, up to a um, million dollars each, where they will do policy research. Um, at that point, they are required by statute to become self-sufficient. Um, they will go out and be, get research grants and that sort of thing from different areas. They can do it from Carnegie. They can sell, you know, do research for independent school districts, contract research, that sort of thing. Um, we are working with TEA to get the uh, RFP, the request for proposal, out as soon as possible. Hopefully, it has to go to the LBB and to the governor's office for approval before it goes out. We're hoping to get that to them this week. Um, and then it will come back, and we are hoping to bring to you in January the um, our recommendation for those research centers. Uh, 
We will be bringing. This is part of House Bill 1. It came out of special session, created these three research centers. It's all tied back to providing vehicles for ongoing research, basically in the P-16 council type alignment. It's going to be looking at these curriculum alignment issues and how effective they are and what are other effective ways of teaching. They're going to be analyzing the data. In the past, there's been very little coordination, apparently, on the research between K-12 and then the higher ed. And so that's another issue that's going to be eliminated in these centers is that it will be a cohesive, integrated research data available. The idea, Susan, is that the host institution will be a higher education? Yes, yes. It has to be a, by statute, the host institutions will be a public higher education. It could be community college, university, but it has to be a public one to be the main entity of the thing. We are also looking at collaboratives where they're working, you know, multiple institutions working together. And are you anticipating a pretty good response to this? I mean, it sounds like from what I can gather, there will be. I think we'll get quite a few people or institutions applying. Commissioner? Just one correction. The language of the statute reads up to three. So we can fund less than three depending on the strength of the proposals and depending on what we think is an acceptable level of funding to get these things off the ground. This is startup funding, obviously, as Susan pointed out. We want to make sure that we don't dissipate the resources to the point where if we went up to three, we wouldn't have enough funding to really get it done. So we will fund up to three. Is this a one-year contract? It is one year, but we are writing into it that they will be required to pledge up to five years, which is, you know, we want it to be. Funding from the state. Part of the RFP with them to raise their own funds. Part of the RFP is evaluating their plan for how to get additional funding to support it. But, Susan, did I understand you say that the seed funding that would be provided through this legislation was up to a million dollars per institution? Per institution. So we couldn't lump the three million dollars into two institutions. I think that's what the commissioner is saying, is we could. If we don't, if we only see two proposals that are worthy, then the three million could be allocated among the two. So it's not limited to a million dollars per institution? I don't think it is. But we can look at that. I don't think it is. Go back. It's up to three million. Total. For up to three. Okay. So then you do have a leeway to use that. We think it's highly likely that we'll at least have one proposal that's a consortium of two or more institutions and multiple entities at an individual institution. We anticipate that. And in terms of what the commissioner was saying was up to three, that Susan and her staff will identify out-of-state researchers in these areas that are very good to do the first pass review to make sure that we're actually identifying institutions and researchers who have some track record, who have a history of doing some good research. Because it's important to put the resources into the people who are capable of doing excellent policy analysis. Actually, I should say that really we've been in the process for about two weeks now of perhaps a little longer of the tweaking of the contract with TEA and the RFP. And so, I mean, I know Bill just this morning was talking with David Anderson at TEA once again. So hopefully we're near this. But it's a matter of a word here and a word there trying to get agreement between the agencies. Mr. Franz can take care of that. Well, and let me just follow up, if I may, real quickly on what David was just saying. And that is that David Anderson on behalf of TEA indicated that he hopes perhaps by the close of business today or at the latest before noon tomorrow to have TEA's response coming back to us on what Susan and Gary forwarded to TEA over the last day, day and a half. So that if the TEA doesn't run into any significant hurdles, we can probably 
hopefully meet Susan's time frame of having this out of our offices by the close of business on Friday. David Anderson, for those of you who don't know, is general counsel for GEA. Okay, good. Any other comments on this issue? Okay. Last item on our agenda is Rider 54, the current Appropriations Act, sought to align the Legislative Budget Board performance measures and the Coordinating Board's accountability measures. You have a copy of that report before you that was submitted to LBB, and Janet Benneke is here, Director of Planning, and will give us a brief report on this alignment. Good morning. This is the way the report looks. I hope you've had the opportunity to look at it. As you all know, measuring performance is essential to evaluating institutional effectiveness and efficiency, and for that reason, the LBB has long had in place a system for measuring performance. It started in the 1970s and goes on today. The Coordinating Board also has always measured performance, but we have recently, at the behest of the Governor, coalesced many of our measures into an accountability system, and the first version of that accountability system was produced in 2004. Because both of these processes are intending to do the same thing, they have the same purpose, many of the measures between the two systems are similar, and some measures are actually identical, which is good. Other measures appear to be identical, but they are actually not, and let me give you a few examples to give you a context for that. Both of the systems have within them the FTE, faculty-student ratio measure. The measure used by the LBB did not count teaching assistance. The one used by the Coordinating Board did. Now, for some institutions that have very few teaching assistants, that really doesn't make any difference, but some institutions have lots, and that meant that two measures that looked like they were both talking about the same thing really produced different results. So in this particular instance, we have agreed to take teaching assistance out of our measure. Another example would be persistence rates, and these are when you track first-time, full-time students who start one fall and see if they've returned the following fall. The measure used by the LBB followed first-time, full-time freshmen. The one that we used followed first-time, full-time undergraduates. Now, that's a not very great difference, but it does result in a difference in the number of students. The reason we changed ours, and we changed ours to match the federal number, is that there are an awful lot of students who come into college anymore with enough semester credit hours gained through either testing or dual credit classes or AP in order to actually have sophomore standing, but they're really first-time in-college students, so we want to follow them. Another issue on this particular measure was that the LBB only looked at persistence in the same institution. Because we're interested in following students who are still in higher ed, we would track their persistence at any institution. So now we break out ours to follow the student and report if they're in the same institution or if they're in a different institution, so that our measure can now look the same as the LBB measure, and they have agreed to go with the undergraduate cohort. But you can see that these kind of things do create problems where you end up with differences in reporting, and for that reason, the 79th legislature passed a rider as part of the Appropriations Act that required the Coordinating Board to work with the LBB to align our measures. And since that time, we have been working on this process, and it's been somewhat slow, but we're getting towards the end of it now. For all those measures that were substantially identical, we looked at if there was a federal reporting requirement, and if there was, that was important because it's easier if what's measured at the state level matches what's measured at the federal level. Another thing we took into consideration was whether the Coordinating Board could calculate the measure. That was one of the hallmarks of our accountability system was that we said most everything in there needs to be something that the Coordinating Board can calculate, and there are a number of things in the LBB system that we don't actually get reported to us. And 
all of the all of this effort was was undertaken with the intent of reaching agreement on the measures and I think we've been largely successful in that process the coordinating board has now revised our measures to meet the the joint new measures and for the university's health related institutions and state colleges those will be what gets reported by the end of this year as part of accountability for the LBB they actually have to take their their staff is in agreement they have to take their measures to their board for final approval they don't think that's going to be a problem and there they've already had their reporting process for fall 2006 so that the new measures won't go into effect until next year for the LBB there are still some areas where we need to continue to meet the the major one concerns the Texas State Technical Colleges and the Lamar State Colleges our measures at this point or in the past did substantially agree but we want to change the state college measures to be more similar to the community college measures those institutions are basically the same as community colleges and we've worked closely with the Association of Community Colleges the governor's office and the LBB to come up with new and better measures for the community colleges so we would like to to apply those same measures to the state colleges and then there are a few remaining things like spatialization you just heard about that our measures actually agree now but we're going to be changing them so we'll have to make sure that that change gets implemented and that really brings up another aspect is that measurements never a static process we'll always be looking for better measures and as we do that and go through the process we'll make sure in the future that we have agreement between the LBB and the coordinating board measures so we won't have to work with this alignment issue in the future and I think I think this is critical from the standpoint I I know commissioner in the past and the leadership particularly in the legislature will see our figures on a particular item and see LBB's and there's been confusion and anytime we can eliminate confusion and the data is consistent I think that's a plus for everybody because when there's confusion then if things don't get done like we want them to do that yeah they I just wanted to remind the board and our new members that one of the stated objectives when when we adopted the account or said we were going to develop an accountability system was to in fact reach agreement between our goals and and the LBB even prior to the legislation so this was something that the board wanted staff to pursue and the legislation helped us do that so that this is really a great breakthrough you mentioned here that there are three areas that there's still need to be some additional change you mentioned spatialization and then what tell me what we're talking about on developmental education and teacher education with developmental education we actually worked with the community colleges in the process with TACC and the governor's office and the LBB to come up with developmental ed measures for the community colleges those measures we now are going to report for the universities and there's some question about whether the wording that's in the LBB's measures will be flexible enough to accommodate the new measures that we've developed so it's just it's just kind of a cleanup but they were in on the process of developing those measures for the community colleges so it's not a matter of us being on a different page no no yeah and the same issue for the teacher ed thank you Jen any questions or comments on this matter good work Miss Brown do you have anything else that this committee needs to consider I think we're done very good we the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn second by Mr. Foster all in favor stand up